Tonight, we're so glad to welcome Mark Brackett and Robin Stern. Um, welcome to, to this part of Yale. You're already at yeah. Yale. Robin Stern, uh, Dr. Robin Stern, is the Associate Director of Partnerships for the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, a licensed psychoanalyst, educator, and author with over 25 years of experience treating individuals, couples, and groups. Robin holds a doctorate in applied psychology from New York University and a postdoctoral certificate in psychoanalytic group psychotherapy from the Postgraduate Center for Mental Health. She's on the faculty of Teachers College, Columbia University, where she co-teaches a class on emotional intelligence, and she's a co-creator and lead facilitator for Yale's Institutes here. Robin's research aims to increase parent involvement in children's emotional intelligence education. In collaboration with Facebook, she created a reporting process for cyberbullying incidents and a help center for bullied children. She's currently analyzing data from the project to gain a deeper understanding of cyberbullying. Dr. Stern's work can be read in Psychology Today, The Huffington Post, Time.com, and many other places. Dr. Mark Brackett is founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and a professor in the Child Study Center, Yale School of Medicine at Yale University. His research focuses on the role of emotions and emotional intelligence in learning, decision-making, and mental health, on the measurement of emotional intelligence, and on the influences of emotional intelligence training on children and adults' health. Mark has published 125 scholarly articles, or 126, so 130, and has received numerous awards. Um, he regularly consults with large companies on best practices for integrating the principles of emotional intelligence into training and product design. He's a co-founder of OG Life Lab, a corporate learning firm that develops innovative digital learning systems for emotional intelligence. With Facebook, Mark has developed a number of products, including social resolution tools to help adults and youth resolve online conflict. And most interesting of all, Dr. Brackett holds a fifth degree black belt in Hapkido, there you go. a Korean martial art. And just this afternoon, Dr. Stern and Dr. Brackett were honored at the United Nations, their Women for Peace annual awards luncheon as change makers and educators for bringing, aware, for, quote, bringing awareness to the importance of integrating social and emotional well-being into schools, families, and communities as a pathway to peace around the world. It's quite an impressive honor, and we delight in welcoming you fresh from your visit to the United <laughs> Nations. <laughs> Thank, well, you. Thank you. Thank you. Glad Thanks. you're here. Um, I think we're going to start with you kind of just talking a bit and introducing okay. your work, and then uh, I'll, I'll ask you a few questions, and then I'll turn to you all for questions as well. Okay, okay cool. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, I can only imagine why you came out at 7.30 at night to hear <laughs> Two psychologists talk about feelings. <laughs> so either you're emotionally bankrupt or you have <laughs> um, some other spirit driving you to be here. Um, but thank you for showing up. Uh, so as you heard from Bill, um, my, I have two day jobs here at Yale. One is um, a professor in the Child Study Center and the second is the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence. And just to give you a quick background, um, we are uh, actually just right around the corner on Edward Street, we're that, right across from the Yale Farm. It's that big white stucco mansion. And uh, we are 50 people, uh, which is just <coughs> mind blowing to me. Um, <clears throat> when, we, uh, when we founded the center in 2013, we were about eight people. So it's a big difference. Um, I've learned what I love about leadership and what I absolutely hate about leadership. <laughs> And the reason why I say that is because this year we hired an executive director, so I don't have to be a leader anymore. And I can go back to sitting in coffee shops and thinking, um, which is what I really want to get paid to do, uh, which my brother always argues is like ridiculous. <laughs> but I say, you know, everybody chooses their career. Um, anyhow, uh, so we're a team of 50, and we do lots of things. We publish papers, as you see. Um, most of our research is on the influence and role of emotions in thinking and decision making. Um, right now we have a lot of grants. Uh, the primary area of our grant focused research right now is in measurement. We're really interested in how do you assess someone's emotional intelligence? Um, because it's very difficult to do that. It's easy to ask someone how, you know, I can ask you right now, how on a scale from one to five, I'm gonna ask everyone. 
On a scale from one to 10, let's make it easier. One, you are emotionally the dumbest person you know. <laughs> 10, you are so emotionally intelligent that you could read someone's facial expression from two miles away. <laughs> and you have so many strategies to regulate your feelings that you just, you could get up here and teach us all how to be better at self-care and getting along with people. So one to 10. All right, let's see the room. How many of you are at a one? You are emotionally just like, you're the worst. <laughs> no one. Two, pretty, like, pretty darn low. No one. Three, no one. All right, four, no one. All right, one semi-honest person. <laughs> Five, six. Everyone who's six or higher, please raise your hand. Hands up high. Really, really high. Stretch it out. Look around the room. So 80 to 90% of this room is above average. <laughs> right? Does anyone know anything about like distributions? So now you know why that's complete garbage. Um, as a matter of fact, what our research shows is that the highest correlate of your self-reported emotional intelligence is narcissism. So, that's why I didn't ask somebody who was the eight or the nine or the 10 because I don't want to call you out. Um, so we are really trying to figure out like how do you assess this through what we call performance assessments. What that means specifically is how do we measure it um, by asking you to solve problems about emotions. So for example, if I were to test your emotion perception skills, I would want you to be able to read my facial expression. So let's try that right now. <laughs> okay, what do you think? Uh, I think you think I'm distressed and I'm trying to remain calm? All right. But I expressed that I'm distressed and I'm trying to remain calm. What did you see? I thought you were pretty easygoing. All right, easygoing. Detached. Yeah. Meh. Yeah. Meh. Yeah. Thanks for the compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so, meh, detached, easygoing, this kind of complexity, like distressed, but covering it with happiness. Anybody else? Bored by pretending not to be? I think you're pondering who you are on the scale of one to ten. You think I'm pondering? Okay. Anyone else want to make up an emotion? It felt artificial. So now I'm fake. <laughs> Any other ones? Tired. All right, so I was intentionally trying to show contentment. So now I know why I have no friends around here. <laughs> I'm walking, I'm walking around the L campus, right? Like everybody's like, "Ooh, meh." <laughs> um, so now you know the problem. Um, now the question is, what does that mean, right? Who's right, right? Maybe I am. Like, like we, Robin and I had a student a couple years ago. He goes, what you just showed is so complex, I don't even think you'll ever know it. And I was like, I can't even begin to unpack your issues. <laughs> but the, um, right, think about that. Like what is going on in your, what I'm gonna say, attribution of emotion? Because none of you really know how I'm feeling, right? So you are, based on your life experiences, based on whatever you've had going on in your life, you're kind of looking at this face and body and saying, disappointed, frustrated, overwhelmed, scared, tired, etc. Now, does that mean that it's impossible to read people? No, of course not. But you don't know me that well. Um, and secondly, you didn't ask me how I was feeling, right? You just, or I didn't even ask you to ask me, I just showed something. So one of the things that's really complex in this work on emotional intelligence is this idea of attribution. Has anyone ever, ever had someone in their life attribute emotion to them? 
Like, why are you so angry? Or, my God, you look so upset right now. Well, I wasn't until you said it. I have an aunt who says, as soon as I call her, I'm like, hey, Aunt Phyllis, what's wrong? <laughs> I'm like, I'm just calling to say hi. Um, so point being is that we see at our center emotional intelligence as, an, as a very deep skill. And um, it's not a belief system. Does that resonate with you? Now, you have beliefs about emotions, too. Like some people, we were talking about this earlier, some people have this underlying philosophy of emotion that emotions are bad. As a matter of fact, I'll give you an example of that. I gave a talk last year here at a different department. I will remain nameless, except they were MDs. Uh, and um, the, uh, I, I give this talk. You know I, know, I really know what I'm doing with these things. I'm pretty good at it. At the end of my presentation, this one physician stood up and he looked at me like an eagle might look at a squirrel. <laughs> and he said to me the following, what happened to Yale? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you weren't, you weren't the, the presenter. <laughs> and he goes, Mark, this is Yale. We produce Nobel laureates. Not nice people. <laughs> I'm not being, I'm not joking. And um, I can deal with difficult people. I took a breath. I'm like, you know what? Does anyone else have another perspective on today's presentation? <laughs> Lo and behold, another professor stands up. Here's what I learned, Mark. Sometimes you got to just be a blank blank. Because then people just shut up and do what you tell them to do. I couldn't believe where I was. I mean, this is, you know, we work here, I live here. And so I looked over at the chair of the department and I, I was like kind of a little taken aback by this. And I'm like, are we making like a documentary here? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, like the test of my, like, you know, like, and, um, and the poor guy, I mean, he looks like, he was really in despair. And he goes, why do you think I brought you in? So I tell you that story because Every one of us in this room has a mindset about emotions, right? We see them as strengths or as weaknesses or somewhere in between. Does that resonate with all of you? So there are beliefs about feelings and then there are actual skills that we can use to be emotionally intelligent. At the center, we define emotional intelligence currently as a set of five skills. The first is recognizing emotions. So being accurate at what some of you were, well, actually none of you were good at, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> this reading emotion, recognizing it. The second is understanding emotion. Where is the feeling coming from? The third is, do you have the vocabulary? Think about this for a moment. If you don't have a rich emotion vocabulary, can you label emotions? Can you even read people accurately? So this is when, when from a scientific perspective, you see that there is this intersection of language with the ability to actually decode. If you only know one word, mad, then are you gonna really be able to differentiate annoyed, irritated, angry, enraged, livid? If you only know stressed, but you don't have overwhelmed and anxious and worried and uneasy, right? Can you be as granular as you might possibly be? The fourth skill is expressing emotions, knowing how and when to express emotions. So even here at Yale, there are rules around this. As a matter of fact, in my undergraduate classes on emotional intelligence, I've learned year after year. My favorite one was last year, um, this one student in my class, she said to me, I didn't need these skills to get into Yale, right? And I was like, well, you're gonna need them to get out, <laughs> right? Because like, and maybe some social competence on top of it. Um, but like, think about that, right? I don't, it was, you know, like, firstly, it's so obnoxious, like, it's gross. But anyway, um, there are rules around how we express emotions. And what I learned also from teaching students here for many years is that they're so afraid of being their true selves, right? Because if everyone knows that I feel scared or anxious, even though everybody is, um, they're going to see me as weak. So it's this, the, the way or how and when or our comfort level 
and being vulnerable or expressive, right, varies as a function of our mindsets around these things. If I think that people are going to see me as weak, if I share something about myself that makes me vulnerable, I'm going to hold it inside and suppress it forever. Does that resonate with people? And then there are people who don't care and they just, you know, tell you everything on their mind, um, which is also an issue. (laughs) And then finally, there's the regulation of emotion. Those strategies that we use to help deal with our emotional lives that we have all day. And then also how we help other people to manage their emotions, right? Think about it from a child development perspective. You're not born with a whole tool bag of like effective strategies. Like I didn't learn them until graduate school. I didn't grow up in a family where I was taught these things. I grew up in a family where I had a very anxious mother. So she would say things like this, oh, don't tell me the details, I'll, I'll have a breakdown. And that was like when I was telling her I was being bullied. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, I'm having a breakdown, mom. Like, you're supposed to have the strategies. And she didn't have them. She just never learned them. My father was a tough guy from the Bronx. So my father was like, son, toughen up. I don't know, do I look like a tough guy? Like, <laughs> It never happened. I actually have a fifth degree black belt. I mean, I could eliminate anyone in this room. <laughs> but, like, I'm not a tough guy. I'm not, I don't have a tough bone in my body. I'm like, you know, I'm afraid of my own shadow. Um, so a lot of the way we think about emotions and obviously the skills that we develop come from nurture, not nature. Now it's your turn. You're going to make this personal. Like you stand up, please, and find somebody to stand back to back. I don't think your thing is on. Sorry? I don't think you're on. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to stand back to back with somebody. Okay. So. It's not a time for back rub. It is a time, however, to feel the support of somebody who is working with you and going to be doing the same activity as you at the same time. So I'd like you to please close your eyes, if you will, and go back in time to the home you grew up in. And pick a room and stand in that room. Maybe it's your kitchen. Maybe it's your living room your bedroom, walking in the front door, the garage, the hallway, the dining room. And I'd like you to stand in that room on a typical day. And if there was no such thing as a typical day, pick a day. And begin to walk around your house and see the people you grew up with and notice How are they dealing with their emotions? Do they seem to know what they're feeling? Do they talk about understanding their feelings? Are they labeling their feelings? Are they using a rich vocabulary to express themselves? Are they expressing themselves in the right tone or in an effective tone at the right time to the right person to the right degree? And are they able to effectively and helpfully manage their feelings at times where they're very activated and need to calm down or very lethargic and uninvolved and apathetic and distant and need to activate up? Can they co-regulate with someone else in the family to find a balance and a calm place between themselves and another. What are you learning about emotion in your home? And as you walk around your home, allow yourself in your mind's eye to interact with people who might be in another room. Maybe you're having a calm conversation. Maybe you're having an argument. Maybe you're just witnessing an argument that other people are having. What are you learning? Mm -hmm. 
What are the rules around emotions? What's being encouraged? What is being discouraged in the emotional life of the people you grew up with? And when you have some answers to that, turn around and share them with your partner. Let's come back together, everybody. Thank you. So that trip you just took back to your home, if it were a movie, what would it be called? <laughs> Well, only yesterday. Only yesterday? It was only yesterday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sideways. You don't do that. Okay. Hold on. Is that a movie title? Home Alone. A oh, Home Alone. <laughs> Thank you. Other time. I'm not angry. <laughs> I'm not angry? <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. The return of the cyborg. <laughs> <laughs> the return of the cyborg, okay. Uh, Somebody, okay. Someone else. Don't add violence. Don't add to it. Don't add to it. <laughs> Thank you. And what did you learn? What did you learn doing so, that exercise? What I, what I learned was um, how I wish I was in the jury's house rather than mine. <laughs> <laughs> was that the cyborg house? I'm sorry? No, no. no it wasn't the cyborg house. Okay. No, so so he, got, he, he spoke and he had a chance for me to um, share my recollections, um, but he was in a good place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other learnings? Yes, ma'am. Um, I learned that uh, what I had what I experienced So was that what you downloaded for free from your parents, or was it what you witnessed? Um, the whole, the whole thing. The family, the interactions, and also like, um, making decisions about what Thank you. Other learning? Yes? Uh, my household, there were three distinct ways of regulating and understanding emotion, all that, um, mm -hmm. and how that uh, raised over your environment and attitude. And having learned that, did you take it with you, or do you do it differently? Thank you. Other learnings? Yes? More, maybe more joyous or positive emotions? They, 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 they were there, but not open expected. Yeah, interesting. How many other people found that, that there are some emotions that were comfortably expressed or expressed often and other emotions that were not? And were the emotions that were expressed in your looking back, a surprise to you. Remembering, for example, that wow, it was easy to kind of talk about negativity or anger, but no one ever said I love you. Surprises about that. 
Was anyone surprised? Looking back. What do you mean by that? So certain rules that you kind of live by, or some contract that people agree to without you even knowing. Yeah. Do you want to say something? Oh, um, just that I, I learned that anger was bad. And that was not from something I downloaded from my parents, but it's something uh, my dad. Uh, to the point where, as an adult, I'm terrible. I'm so judgmental towards people who are angry. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that I'm, I'm constantly seeking out, like, you know, that I chill out. <laughs> I need to chill out about the anger piece because yeah. there's no judgment, like you, you're saying, that it's emotion. Yeah. People can feel angry, it's okay. okay. Um, but it's amazing how those things from childhood, oh, they are hard to get rid of. Hard to get rid of, <laughs> absolutely. You have to be a saint as a parent, not to be angry. Well, there you go. <laughs> Well, since I don't know any saints, that, that's... <laughs> yes, of course. I think our work um, guides us to not try to be saints, but figure out the best strategies and most helpful strategies to deal with the anger when it comes up, because we're all going to get angry. Oh, well, you just shout get it out. <laughs> yeah. Not hold the grudge. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are people who feel that way. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. One of the ironies that I, that I downloaded was that I'm from a very large family. There were nine children, eight girls, one boy, and three sisters. There were always like 11 people in the house, but it was never a noisy house, and I didn't realize that. I've never heard my parents raise their voice, and I never heard my parents at an argument. Their room was on the other side. They must have had an argument at 1 a.m. when everybody was sleeping. <laughs> so I've never heard them argue. So what I've brought into my adult life, I just hate an argument. I don't like noise. Like people come to my house and they say, would you turn the TV up? I said, it's loud enough for me. Because I just, I've done it. So I've struggled with noise and, and what I say, I probably say a healthy argument, but it's also quarrelsome to me that I don't like a quarrel. I call it a quarrel. I'm just not used to it, so it drives me insane. So I didn't realize that till you, you know, you, you took me back to my childhood, and I realized that although there were 11 people in that house, it wasn't a noisy house, and we, I mean, I'm from Jamaica, so you played outside a lot. So when I came back with, just now I came to the living room, which was a very pleasant place where the only noise we heard was a, it was a piano that we all had to play. And um, so for me, noise drives me insane. Argue. So well, also it's I'm pretty hard. <laughs> Thank you, and it's pretty hard to know that arguments can be resolved peacefully when you haven't ever seen an argument. Yeah. So when you think about the homes that you live in now, whether you are living alone and you invite guests over, or you're living with someone else or a family. Does it feel the same? And if it doesn't feel the same, what's different than the home you just visited in this reflection? Take a minute and think about that. So I'm going to just leave you with the thought that if it is the same and there's something you want to change, we have the skills to help you do it. And if there's a lot that's different, to wonder what helped you to move from that home to where you are now. And we'll stop there for tonight. Now it's your turn. Thank you. <clears throat>
So let me, <clears throat> let me dare to, to speak for at least a few who are saying, who I'm saying, all right, this is really intriguing work, um, personal work. <clears throat> a lot of folks here are, are headed into uh, helping professions of ministry, of, of uh, work with hurting people. Um, talk a little bit about the use of this kind of emotional intelligence, awareness, this, 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 this toolkit in the, in the midst of, um, of that kind of work. I can define it more fully, but just in, in communities who gather, as a leader in communities who gather. Um, what, how do you access this kind of intelligence and what do you do with it once you've accessed it? So that's a big question, but I'll yeah. start somewhere. Okay. And I'll start with ourselves. So in, um, in the work we do at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, we start with adults first. So no matter who you are talking with and whether they have been through a, a dramatic moment or as a as an individual, or whether there's a community that has suffered a loss or been through a dramatic moment, checking in with yourself to know what you are feeling, to be able to shift yourself to a place where you're ready to have a conversation, where you're ready to listen. We all are triggered by what we hear around us. And when we can bring ourselves to a calm place, we're ready to be open to what's in front of us and to have all of our full faculties to be able to make a good decision, have a compassionate response. Just want to add to that. Um, I'll add the, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I find interesting in terms of the, the science of emotion and the way we um, conceptualize emotions is that we create our feelings. So people don't like to hear that because they like to blame other people for triggering them, right? Like, you made me feel angry. It was what you said and what you did. And that's not really the way the brain works, right? Unfortunately, our brains don't like reach out and tell, you know, it doesn't work that way. What happens is that we interpret information and we make meaning out of it. And so, I mean, for a child, that's not possible, but for an adult, it is. So the child who is yelled at, screamed at, you know, and grows up in a traumatic circumstance, right? You're constantly activating their stress system, and that's obviously impacting their healthy development. But for an adult, um, I, I'll give you the best example. It's with my father. Uh, my father just never really could relate to me because I never became that tough guy. And, um, and then when I got a job at Yale, it was interesting because my father was an air conditioning repairman, and he was a smart, really smart person, but not educated. And he really couldn't relate to the academy or to an Ivy League university. And then when I started having like fancy words for like, I can reappraise that situation. Uh, he had phrases for me, which I won't say because we're in the divinity school. Um, and um, in the early days of my life with my father, I would take what he would say and I would get really activated by it. And we would go, and then I started learning more and practicing more. And then there were these times where my father would be yelling, screaming at me, saying things that were maybe not so great. And I would just put a little picture frame around my dad. And I'd be like, wow, that is a fascinating movie. <laughs> and I would distance myself psychologically from the anger. Now, I still felt uncomfortable that my father was yelling at me. But the difference was that I didn't allow it to have the power over me. Does that resonate with everyone? Yeah. Um, that's hard work and it requires practice because when you are activated, like if I were to say something to offend somebody, you're like, boom, you just offended me, which is based on your history. Because I always say like five of us can go on the roller coaster ride. One of you is like, go faster, go faster. The other, one's like, ah. the other one is like, oh my God, I'm going to get killed. Um, right? Three people, same exact roller coaster ride, completely different emotional responses which means that we are creating our feelings. Does that resonate? Yeah. That's hard to reconcile with. You gotta like, oh, wait a minute. Like I'm creating the anger. It doesn't mean that what people are doing to you is okay. Do you follow? So I, I'm 
glad you said yeah. that because it can be a slippery slope if you find yourself reappraising or putting in a picture frame someone's bad behavior over and over and Correct. over Correct. That's when you have to become that scientist and say, all right, there's a pattern here of abuse. Am I willing to accept this or not? And do I need to, you know, we work with schools and there's a lot of dysfunctional relationships in schools between teachers and principals. And like I have teachers say to me, like, every time I look at my principal, I feel like losing it. I'm like, maybe it's just time to get a new job. You know, like if you're constantly having that strong feeling about someone and they're not changing their behavior and you don't want to have that feeling, you're not going to change the principal most likely. So you've got to make a decision. Can you reappraise it and continue on without it affecting you systemically? Or do you need to um, leave the situation? So there's, you know, there's, I think there's this clinical application to this work. And then there's kind of like just changing the way we think about the concepts. And um, for me, it's been very comforting to recognize that I have the choice to have the feeling. You're not making me feel this way. I'm choosing to have this feeling. And I could choose not to have that feeling, which is not easy or comfortable for certain people. And again, it's a slippery slope. Yeah. Does that make sense also? With the way Robin, like, I'm talking for Robin now because I know her work, is that when it starts becoming slippery is when you slip into the mindset that other people are kind of defining your reality, when you start believing it. You know, when, when you... When you start believing it or when you start um, to make it okay that it's happening because it's not, I'm, I'm just creating this feeling. And then when somebody says, you're just creating that feeling. Right, it's like it's that, just the, the, the delusionment, the delusionment it. around it. Well, it's like, maybe I am too sensitive. Yes, or somebody telling you, wait a minute, I didn't... I didn't do anything mean to you. It's just your sensitivity. Right, you're, you're, you're creating that feeling. No, you're a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> that, but that's, that's the hard work. But it really is something to consider because you can appraise <clears throat> situations, and, and we do appraise situations differently, and yet if you trust yourself, and that's really key, if you trust yourself, then you can unpack that and say, wait a minute, do I really feel this way? And is it in response to something that's going on, even if you're not making me feel this way. Tell us some more about how we do that. How do we, how do, we do this processing? I mean, you probably aren't willing to go with us back to our work sites and to our schools. And How do you do this work? How do you engage this work? With a therapist? Uh, with self-study? I mean, what's the, what's the process? I, well, either one of those are a pretty good uh -huh. way to start. One of the things <clears> that I... I mean, people are, are right with you here. You can hear them. So they're, they, they're, they're with you so far. How do you, how do you keep going? One of the things that I tell people very often is to journal, and to go over the conversation, and particularly to write down the conversation. I said this, you said this, I said this, you said this. And often you notice in those situations where you're trying to be convinced out of what you're feeling, or when you begin to let go of what you're feeling in favor of the other person's reality, which I call gaslighting, and actually, I wrote a book about that a few years ago, so I know a little bit about that. Um, writing those scripts down, you can watch when that conversation veers off, or just replaying it in your head. So in the situation that we were just talking about, where somebody says, oh, you're too sensitive. Actually, you may be too, you may be very sensitive, but that doesn't mean that the person you're talking to isn't also responsible for something they're doing. And I would just add, I mean, there's many techniques that we can use. Robin mentioned this one. Another one, is, another one is to anticipate. So how many of you here have like triggers? <laughs> Any of you have like 100 triggers? <laughs> um, so best, ex I'll give you a personal one that I know why I should share this right now. But um, we have, I, I, um, I think everything's a ripoff. I just do. <laughs> and I'm like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so at the grocery store, my partner's buying almond milk. It's like six, six yeah. dollars for almond milk. And I could have a complete milk attack milk. about this. <laughs> I mean, I can make up a story about this almond milk and I can go into a whole thing and I have to walk away and I can't take it. Right? 
just over expensive almond milk. <laughs> so we all have issues. Um, and the question is, can I anticipate that's a trigger for me? Right, so I know that that's one of my triggers. Another one of my triggers being a professor here is entitlement. I have zero tolerance for it. Like, Professor Brooke, I've got a question, but uh, I'm not really sure you know the answer. It's like, really? Like that's the you know. So you see, you didn't even re, you didn't even flinch from that, right? Like, <laughs> like that's the way it is at Yale. <laughs> to me, it's like I cannot believe an 18 year old has that kind of arrogance. Like, I just it's so disrespectful to me. So I know that's a trigger for me. So the question is, now that I know it's one of my triggers, can I plan my response? Right? Can I say to myself, Mark? This is one of your triggers, so now you know you're gonna be the feelings master. And you're gonna twist that around in a way to make that student reflective as opposed to be a nasty professor and like retaliate. Does this make sense? But so that's the, it's like a planning. It's like, I gotta sit back, it takes a lot of effort and time. All right, Mark, trigger entitlement. Um, I had a student, for example, Professor, it's nine o'clock at night, it's Sunday, and um, you know, my parents were around all weekend and we had dinners and sporting events and I don't think I have enough, I just don't have enough bandwidth to study for the exam tomorrow. <laughs> I'm like, cry me a freaking river, right? Like, and like, I need you to get back, and, and then the, the email was, I need you to get back to me ASAP to let me know if I need to pull an all night or if I can go to sleep. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. You know, like what Mark, the true self wanted to say, I can't repeat. <laughs> Um, so the question is, can I anticipate all these different ways of being activated and have like my planned response so that I'm not hijacked and having this cortisol constant right, activation all the time? What, what questions are just in you and you're ready to go? That is the, the relation to it. The, the, I, I won't get angry from this book. No one, no one in this room can make me angry. But my wife and my children, yeah, because you will get you won't get arrested here for being nasty. <laughs> no, you will get arrested. Um, typically, what we find, which means that you chose to have the emotion again. Does it, do you see what I'm saying? So, if you're telling me here, this happens all the time, and Robin does it with couples therapy and like teachers and students and families, like my husband never, you know, everybody says he's a saint at work, but then he can't regulate at home. So it doesn't mean that you can't regulate. It means that you're choosing in that context to not regulate, or you're choosing in that context to allow that person to get the best of you. So the answer is you, again, from, the perspective of the constructed emotion model is that you are allowing yourself to experience certain emotions in certain contexts and not in others. It would be really interesting to piggyback off what you're saying. Just you turn your mic on. Try to, whoops. It would be really interesting for you to try to, to capture your thinking while you're angry at your family. I mean, could it possibly be something like, I can't believe you said that again. Okay. I can't believe you said that again. Or, oh my God, here we go again. Something like that, that goes along with your feeling. Well, you might not have that in another context. So it'd be, I would be interested to know what your thinking is. Because if you could then begin to have a different, um, reframe it, or have a different set of things that you say to yourself, at that moment, you might find that your feeling would ultimately, over time, be a little bit differently to you. It might be softer, less intense. I thought it's about people like the red. Some people more important than red. Some expectation. Sure. If I don't have an expectation, why should I get angry? I think he's an idiot. Then go home. Yes. My son and my wife are can. Right, so you have expectations and that comes along with thoughts that you have as well. Um, I want to say thank you so much for this. This is really beautiful. Um, so my question actually has to do with um, emotional 
challenges as a potential veteran. And I'm wondering, um, so I have met people where I kind of talk to them and I'm like, oh wow, um, they're, they're so emotionally intelligent. But then I kind of watch how they interact with other people. And I think to myself, oh, they're actually just using it for their own gain. <laughs> and um, it's a powerful gift, but I'm wondering in your research if you had any insight as to um, how to make sure to to frame emotional intelligence within a, a very strong core of empathy and uh, even like self-sacrifice mm -hmm. Well, any intelligence can be used for the good or the bad. So people who are like, there's a lot of really smart people who are evil. Um, and same with emotional intelligence. It's tricky. Now, here's the thing. Most people who have a high, who are adept at certain things, like if you are, most people who have a brain that really works fast and, you know, a high IQ, they use the IQ wisely, they read more, they study more, they go to college, they go to graduate school or something like that. Not everybody. Um, but the, for the most part, people use their competencies and skills in a way that is helpful. But of course, um, these constructs um, coexist with others. So for example, Machiavellianism or morality. So you can imagine someone being l high in emotional intelligence and high in Machiavellianism, like the car salespeople that we read, <laughs> um, right? They're like manipulating, like touch the steering wheel, <laughs> right? Feel the leather seats, you know? Now, if you're high in emotional intelligence, then you know you're being manipulated. So this is why you have to be really um, uh, skilled in this area. You know, it's like, because whenever I go buy something, like with salespeople, or I'm like, I just got to let you know. Like my whole career is dedicated <laughs> right? to like, and then of course I get sucked into the whole thing and I buy the car anyway, <laughs> you know? Um, but my point is, is that you really have to be, um, it's going back to even the slippery slope thing, slippery slope thing, which is um, if you're interacting with someone who is really manipulative, they're trying to get to your feelings to persuade you to do things that are not the best. You've got to be the scientist who's saying, wait a minute here. What's going on? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please. So a lot of the tests that you're using actually really really hard um, and painful to go through on the test. So I think you can talk a little bit about when you choose a test and how you get more activated and motivated. So in my experience as a clinician, um, a lot of motivation comes from being uncomfortable enough that you just know you have to do it differently. And then a lot of motivation comes from having an ideal of who you'd like to be in the world and having an ideal of what kind of reputation you'd like to have. And Mark and I built a tool called the Meta Moment and Best Self a few years ago based on what we both knew was the reason that people self-regulated. Like, why bother if you're not after some greater good? Right. And it is very hard, absolutely very hard. We're experts in this. And we're regularly turning to each other and saying, I think you need to take a better moment. And I say it to her more often than you. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when she's on the phone with her kids. <laughs> Just, it, go ahead. It, it's very hard and it requires practice. And we say all the time, it's the journey of a lifetime. So you can spend the next day with us, as you will, learning these strategies and then the rest of your life, practicing them and getting better and better and better at them. Just to add to that, I think, is be, if you're brought up, like many of you seem to have been brought up in families that emotions were just not part of, you know, they were dismissed you know, um, or they were just not seen as important, right? It's hard to all of a sudden, like when we go into schools, like a 50 or 60 year old teacher, we're like, guess what you're doing now? You're gonna check in with your feelings every day. They're like, get out of my face. Um, so it's hard to switch people. Hopefully, you know, our dream is that we create an emotion revolution so that from birth, preschool, elementary, middle, high school students are learning these concepts. Now, I think another piece of this, which is relevant I think, to all of us, 
is that typically our automatic strategies for dealing with our feelings require no effort, right? It's easy to say, go blank yourself. It's easy to avoid, it's easy to suppress, it's easy to punch, it's easy to kick, it's easy to yell, it's easy to drink an extra beer, right? Those strategies require very little effort. They tend to never help you solve the problem. They tend to um, be self-destructive, other destructive. So like bringing people into that awareness for us is really important. And then you think about the helpful strategies which require a lot of effort, like you gotta pause, you gotta breathe, you gotta anticipate. Ugh. But then you think about the benefits. Wow, I'm physically more healthy because I do exercise. Wow, I'm eating healthier. Wow, I'm sleeping more. Wow, I have better friendships. Wow, my significant other likes me more. Wow, do you see what I'm saying? So you have to be able to, I think, and notice the difference between these automatic unhelpful ones and how over time, right, they derail you from achieving goals and health and life. Whereas these helpful ones, while they are more effortful, the payoff is a lot greater. And I think just to add to that, just to add to that, the, that sometimes you either happen upon a helpful strategy and it works and it becomes self-reinforcing, or you do it as an experiment. You know, I'll try something different this time. And then it works in a more helpful way. And that, again, becomes self-reinforcing, notwithstanding very effortful, as Mark was saying. Um, I found that in Finding one person that is safe to practice with has been powerful. Yeah. So, and also even creating a dynamic where you're allowed to kind of check each other. You have this agreement. And so it may be difficult to do it with your parents because they're a big trigger. So you don't necessarily start there, but you pick someone and then it's safe there. And then you have to move up. Yes. Yeah, like we call them meta moment buddies sometimes. Yeah. And you have to give permit, like, so what we have in our center, for example, we give each other the permission, right? So Robin, it's okay, like, if my partner says, you know, Mark, you need to take a meta moment, doesn't always work out very nicely. <laughs> I'll give, you wanna see a meta moment? I'll give you a meta moment, you wanna see a meta moment? Um, whereas if you give that person the permission to say, you know, I think it might be a good time to take this meta moment, it makes a big difference. Um, I think the most exciting thing that's happening in our center um, is this idea of creating, is making Connecticut the first emotionally intelligent state. You know, I've spent 20 years of my life and Robin at the center for many years now. Um, I started off this work like wanting to help middle school kids because I was bullied in middle school and I hated school and I was not a good student in school to be kinder, more compassionate, teachers to understand that how kids feel matters for learning and things of that sort. We didn't have such good results because we recognized that the adults just didn't have the skills to do what we want them to do. So I went back and taught the teachers about their own skills. Then we had principals who really weren't so skilled and they'd say things, well, you can start this program after the state tests, mm -hmm. which were like in May. <laughs> we're like, wait a minute, that's a waste of time. And then we went to New York City and we had systems to work with, you know, like boroughs and systems. And what I've noticed and what we've noticed, you know, in this work is that really we have to create kind of ecologies where emotional intelligence matters. So right now we're working with the Department of Education in the state of Connecticut, we're working with the State Superintendents Association, we're working with the unions, we're working with the Connecticut Commission on Women, Families, and Children. We're working with um, just a, the School Boards Association, and we're just trying to get everybody on what we like to call the Emotions Matter bus. And if we can shift the mindsets of all these different organizations to take this work seriously and get the superintendents involved and get the unions involved, then maybe just maybe we can create right, that ecosystem where there's a common language across an entire state, where there are strategies that every kid learns in order to um, develop the skills they need to navigate their lives. So 
That's the hope and dream. The challenge with that project is the funder saying, well, how are you going to measure your outcome? <laughs> and I'm like, give me a freaking break. Um, we have the vision. You figure out how to measure it. Um, but truthfully, it's a, it's, a very, it's a big project. And how do, you, how do we know we're successful? And uh, so that's one of the things that we're grappling with as a center is how do we not measure the individual or the school or the district or the city, but like how do we measure the success of this work across an entire state? So to me, that's the biggest challenge, but the most exciting thing. And, and I would add to that that the reason we were at the UN this, this afternoon is to, um, to launch a collaboration with the United Nations Women for Peace Association so that we can bring this work to more states through the agency of women leadership as well, and then ultimately around the globe. And, and in addition to what you said, I think one of the other things that's been very exciting for us is the opportunity to work with Facebook and with Google and with Instagram to help to make those social media spaces and interactions much more compassionate because our kids are in trouble and we're seeing it daily. And, and often the conversations go on and on about how terrible it is, but there don't seem to be very many solutions. And we have worked with Facebook in the past and we began to build, we built something called the Bully Prevention Hub. We built some social resolution tools for kids when they were uncomfortable online. What could they do about it? And that's just the beginning. There's gotta be more we can do and we know there is. It is. It's just, it's a new it's a new playground that nobody yes. knows how to nobody knows. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a reception, and we hope you'll stay and continue this conversation. But first, will you join me in thanking Robin Stern? Yeah. And Mark thank you, everybody.